Well, what's up, good people? Mark Holmes here, and as always, I want to thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Blue Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. Um, you know, it's a time of year, unfortunately, that off season that gets to be kind of crazy. You know, everybody's coming out the woodwork and stuff right now, talking about how the Dallas Cowboys are ass. Now, I, I just don't see how Skins fan all day has any right whatsoever to come out and talk about the Cowboys. I, I just don't know. You know, I can understand the 49ers and things like that, you know, teams that actually beat us. But to have some of these mother humpers that are talking trash is just ridiculous. But it's okay. It's, 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 it's fine. It's cool. We deserve it. We got our ass kicked at home. No excuses about it. We got beat. We got out coached. We got outplayed. They ran on us. We couldn't complete a pass. In fact, you know what? It, it, it's literally, you could have done the Jim Mora rant about what happened. But you know what? We can't change anything that happened on Sunday any more than what we can change over the course of the last 26 years. The only thing we can do is move forward and start trying to fix this stuff. Now, one of the reasons why I started doing Joe Blue Sports Report was because the narrative that you sometimes get is bullshit. You know, kind of like Dan Orlovsky kind of told you that, you know, we can manipulate the numbers any which way that you can. You know, it's funny because I had a conversation with um, Philip, and Philip was talking about statistics class, you know, which is mean, median, mode, and modulation, different ways to take the same data and basically prove different points. And he was talking about his professor when he went in, he said, this isn't statistics, this is manipulations class, because that's what statistics really are. But here's where I want you guys to understand, because there's a narrative that you always hear on the shows, you know, they try and tell you that, oh, you know, this and that and all that, to try to prove their point and set a narrative and ultimately to get clicks. In the end, that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants people to watch. And it's sad because it used to be ESPN was the standard bearer of actually getting the sports news and getting it accurately. Now it's all turned into reality shows to who could yell louder and trash somebody the most and, and get the views. Now here's one of these things that we are always hearing. You'll hear it on uh, Undisputed. You'll hear it on Colin Cowherd. You'll hear everybody always touting and saying that the Dallas Cowboys have the best offensive line in football. And you could say that that was true in, say, 2014, 15, and 16, when Zach Martin, Travis Frederick, and Tyron Smith were young guys playing together. They were great. That offensive line no longer exists. And see, here's where the problem is. And I hope I have the right one in here. If we look up here, this is, you know, the, the boys at Pro Football Focus skip. You know, they watch a lot of football, Skip. They know it. when pro football focus tells you something, you can believe it because they know what they're talking about. And this is pro football focus's final offensive line rankings. And see, this is setting a narrative that I, I think is bullshit. Because here's what they have. And, and you answer this to me. By Sam Monson, this was just uh, five days ago. The Dallas Cowboys hitting into the 2021 NFL playoffs uh, with the single best offensive line in the game this season. According to Pro Football Focus data, in fact, the top five offensive lines in the football all will be playing this season with the first team to miss out being the Washington football team. At the bottom end of the rankings, you can start to pinpoint where things went off the rails for several franchises. The New York Giants, the Carolina Panthers sank even deeper in the season of blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, they ranked the Cowboys, evidently, number one all season. And their rankings are Tyron Smith got a 91.9. Connor Williams got a 76.4. Tyler Badish, a 64.8. Zach Martin, outstanding, 94.2. Uh, 
Ryan, uh, Lyle Collins, 84.0. Um, um, and you look at that and say, yeah, you know, Dak Prescott stinks, man, because he has the best offensive line in football. Couple of things. First of all, if hypothetically, let's say you're saying that that is the best offensive line, those five guys. Well, here's the first problem. Those five guys right there only played three games together all season. That combination right there, or excuse me, right, right here, only played three games together all season. Here's the second problem you have. Tyron Smith missed six or seven games. Connor Williams was the turnover magnet. Excuse me, not turnover, excuse me. Penalty magnet. I think he was the highest penalized offensive lineman in football. He got benched because his play wasn't good, and they brought in Connor McGovern, thinking that Connor McGovern would be an improvement. Connor McGovern couldn't get to the second level. Connor McGovern was then replaced by, of course, Connor Williams. Tyler Badish. Tyler Badish has had a couple of good games. Tyler Badish, though, has a problem with physical nose tackles. Vita Vays eat him for lunch and drop him off in Dak Prescott's lap. Looking at this offensive line, oh, and Lyle Collins, by the way, he missed seven games. Once, now, now I could make the argument, I could make the argument that they were correct for about the first six games. That the Dallas Cowboys offensive line, you could probably say, was the best offensive line in football. Because that's when Tyron Smith hadn't had any issues with his ankle or knee or anything else, you know, breaking apart. You had Terrence Steele, who was in place of Lyle Collins, who was serving a suspension. And Terrence Steele, I believe, is actually one of the better offensive linemen that we have. Connor Williams was still making the penalties and getting beat from time to time, but you were okay because um, Terrence Steele was playing so well and Tyron Smith was playing so well. Badish, you remember the Tampa Bay game, got beat like a, like a drum. He literally got beat like a drum. And, of course, Zach Martin is the all-pro that he always is. But once Tyron Smith got hurt, you now took a guy who's in his second year, who was terrible the year before, who was playing great at right tackle. Now we put him over at the left. And the first couple of games, he was awful. He was horrendous. And you brought back Lyle Collins. And Lyle Collins isn't the same guy that he was. I think, honestly, Lyle Collins may be better suited to be a guard, and maybe you end up putting Terrence Steele back out at right tackle, and maybe you roll the dice with Tyron Smith and try and hold on to him. But Connor Williams, I'm sorry, it's just he's just never panned out the way he thought. Now, if that was the best offensive line in football, then there are some pretty pathetic ones because that offensive line, here's what's crazy. Let's just take a look. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the numbers here to see if my, my case is actually correct. Because when you look at what Zeke Elliott was doing early part of the season, I don't know why we're jumping around like that. Okay. Um, New England, he ended up doing – okay, wait, 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 wait. Oh. Um, rushing yards, 33, 71, 95, 143, 110. Boom. And then 69 against New England. And that's when Tyron Smith got hurt. All of a sudden, from that point on, if you're saying the best offensive line, Zeke Elliott, who had had a game, you know, a couple of games over 100, now has got 50, 51, 41, 32, 25, 45, 45. Wait a minute. Okay. Maybe you can say, well, Zeke Elliott's got a lot of miles on him. He's not a good back. Well, Tony Pollard is a good back. And here's the thing. Let's do the same thing. Tony Pollard, 14 yards, 100, 109, 60, 67, 75, 41. After Tyron Smith gets hurt, 26, 11, 42, 50, 36, 
71 and 74, you, you know, 34, 9, 14. You're telling me that the best offensive line in football can't open up holes for the running backs? FYI, Sunday in the playoffs, we gave up five sacks. I think 14 pressures and like 10 quarterback hits from the best offensive line in football. We honestly believe that they think that that is the best offensive line in football. I don't see how that's the case. Now, the Cowboys, if they want to get back into the winning thing, and you can say, well, Dak Prescott's got to have everything perfect. Well, I'll be honest with you, that offensive line right there isn't anywhere close to being the best. That offensive line has got to be rebuilt. You have to try and we keep rolling the dice on Tyron Smith every year now to say, okay, you know, he'll, he'll stay healthy. But the reality is 2016, he missed three games. 2017, he missed three games. 2018, he missed three, three or four games. 2019, um, he missed three games. 2020, he missed 14. He missed six or seven this year. So you have to look at this and say, either if I bring back Tyron Smith, I have to have somebody who is a capable backup to replace him because he's going to break down. Connor Williams, I think he's got to be replaced, and maybe you end up moving Lyle Collins. But then again, Lyle Collins is $15 million cap hit next year, and maybe you look at replacing him. And then you've got, of course, uh, Tyler Badish. Backup center, no problem. Maybe given some more time, he'll become a great center. But you got to have somebody who can play that ball uh, we can play center better than what he's got. If we can fix the offensive line, Zeke Elliott will be more effective. You can't get rid of Zeke because of his contract. You owe him too much unless you want to take a $30 million uh, dead money cap hit. You're not going to do that. Tony Pollard is a good back too, but they have to have some holes to run it. Now, here's what's kind of funny to me because, you know, a lot of times the grass is always greener on the other side. People think, oh, man, you know, let's get rid of Mike McCarthy. You know, we'll get somebody else. So let's say, get rid of Dak. Let's, let's trade for Russell Wilson because then we're winning Super Bowls. Here's the thing. You know, everybody has got this infatuation with Sean Payton. Man, if we could just get Sean Payton in here, man, you know, we'll be great. Now, understand, New Orleans the last few years has had a lights-out defense led by my man Demario Davis. They have – the NFL all-time leading yardage passer in Drew Brees. He'll be a Hall of Famer. They've had some great running backs like Alvin Kamara and uh, Michael Thompson, you know, wide receivers. They've had pieces, but guess what? With Sean Payton, they were dropping out of the playoffs early. And I know you can say, oh, well, some bad calls. Well, we, we get that all the time. But here's the thing, you know, when you look at Sean Payton, he had 2014, 2015, and 2016, not 8-8, eight and 8-8, eight. Eight and 8-8, eight. Eight and 7-9, eight. Seven 7-9, seven 7-9. Seven and as great as he is, he's had a 12-5 and five team, didn't make the Super Bowl. He's had a 13-3 and three team, didn't make the Super Bowl. Had another 13-3 and three team, didn't make it out of the first round. Had a 12-4 and four team. Nothing. So saying, oh, well, he's garbage. Well, here's the reality. Sean Payton, Mike McCarthy, they have the same amount of wins. Don't say that, well, you know, Mike McCarthy had Aaron Rodgers. Well, Sean Payton had Drew Brees. Then there's Russell Wilson. People say, if we just had Russell Wilson, we'd win the Super Bowl every year. Well, Seattle won one with Russell Wilson. And at that time, they had a great back in beast mode who could control the clock and could pound the rock and, and deliver game after game. They had a number one scoring defense, number one yardage defense, and number one at taking away the football. At that time, Russell Wilson only threw 22 touchdown passes win the Super Bowl. Since that time, Russell Wilson has thrown a lot of yards. 
Now, if you look up here at the numbers, you'll see his first couple of years, 3,100 yards, 26 TDs, 10 touchdowns. 3,300 yards, 26 TDs, 9 touchdowns. 3,400 yards, 20 TDs, 7 touchdowns. And then you start seeing some 4,000, 4,200, and so on. 34 and 7 TDs, 21 and 11, 34 and 11. You know, you're seeing great numbers there. But here's the thing. Without beast mode, without that defense, since 2017, 9 and 7, 10 and 6, 11 and 5, 12 and 4, 6 and 8. So as much as we think that it's just getting the quarterback, it's beyond that, guys. If you're saying that Dak Prescott needs things perfect, well, evidently, so does Russell Wilson because he's not winning them without it. And I dare say Aaron Rodgers needs things perfect, too, to win because he's won one. That was over 10 years ago. But I understand Everybody wants their pound of flesh right now, and they want to go ahead and, and you know, fire somebody. They, they just want everything to be fixed immediately and so on. But unfortunately, that's just not the way it works out. As much as we would like to, it's complicated to be able to win in football. But if the Dallas Cowboys do not get this offensive line straightened out next year, you're not going anywhere. And you can blame Dak Prescott, but... If you ended up with an offensive line that can't put 50 yards rushing and can't protect the quarterback better than what they did, I don't care who you got back there. You're not going to win. So that's all I got to say about that. I'm Mark Holmes, and well, you play to win the game. Hello? You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. That's the great thing about sports. You play to win. And I don't care if you don't have any wins. You go play to win. When you start telling me it doesn't matter, then retire. Get out.